Hello beautiful bookworms and welcome back from part two of Book Collecting for Beginners. I'm Jess, head squirrel. In part one I discussed what book collecting actually is beyond the mere accumulation of books. I also provided a litany of ideas for starting your own book collection, so if you haven't already seen that I highly encourage you to start there. Mainly because in this video I'm going to be talking about a particular area of book collecting which tends to be a stereotype and I do not want to give the impression that this is the only area or even the most important area of book collecting. After all, the goal of this series is to prove that book collecting is not merely a hobby for snobby old rich people. Book collecting is just another way of expressing yourself. There are no rules. However, this area of collecting is indeed a popular one and deserves its own video owing to its myriad of complications. Yeah, let's just jump in. When someone says that they are a book collector, the first thing that probably pops into your head is the term first edition. But, and I will continue to reiterate this throughout these videos, collecting can be and often is about so much more than first editions. That said, given how commonly people do jump to first editions, I might as well get it out of the way. If first editions aren't something that interests you, I would recommend at least checking out the later part of this video where I will be discussing the condition of secondhand books. Otherwise, feel free to move on to part three of this series where I discuss where to look for books to add to your collection and reveal my secret weapon. So, what is a first edition? It might sound like a silly question, but actually the term can mean something slightly different depending on the context in which it's used. But generally, we're talking about the very first version of a book when it was originally published. To collectors, this specifically means the first printing of the first edition, as editions can actually have multiple printings. The term edition usually means that something about the book or its printing has changed. But if printers use the exact same materials and process to simply create additional copies, that becomes a new printing. But again, the use of these terms can sometimes fluctuate depending on the publisher's preference. And in this modern world of digital printing rather than physical plates and printing presses, the terms can be muddled up even more. To clarify that we mean a first printing, collectors and book dealers will quite often refer to it as a true first edition. That said, Sometimes a book is published simultaneously by different publishers in different countries, and both may say first edition or first printing on the copyright page. In these cases, the general rule is to follow the flag. That is, the country where the author comes from is the one that generally counts as the true first edition. The other publications should be noted as first edition thus, or first editions in that country. But honestly, that's as far as I'm going to get into identifying first editions because quite honestly that venture needs at the very least its own dedicated video, if not an entire series of videos. Identifying first editions can range from really straightforward to an absolute minefield. So one question you might be asking yourself is, why do people care about first editions at all? Well, many collectors love first editions because that was the first impact that that book had on the world. If collecting first editions does sound like something of interest to you, my personal recommendation would be to first identify why they are of interest to you. If you are purely interested in their status and trade value, then you will need money because at that point it is more of an investment. But if it's something else, perhaps it's the history, the concept of this being the very first time these words were printed. Or perhaps it's something more visual, how this book first appeared. You may be surprised to learn that even as a beginner and even with a tight budget, there are ways you can enter the world of first editions. Full disclosure, I do have a few genuine first editions of value in my collection, but only a few. However, all of them I acquired quite affordably by chance. And the reasons behind such luck have to do with the ideas I'm about to share with you. The much more common alternative in my collection is what I have coined a faux first edition. This is not a term used in the book trade to the best of my knowledge, but just rather one I use personally to describe books that look like first editions but aren't. Instead, they are either early reprints or facsimile reproductions. But wait, I hear you interject. I don't want the fakes, I want the real deal. Hear me out first. If you don't 
don't have the budget to go for a true first edition of a book from the off, early reprints or facsimile reproductions can be really affordable alternatives that will look identical or near identical sitting on your shelf. Then over time, if your budget grows, you can start to replace these with better copies, either earlier printings or copies in better condition, or maybe even ultimately with a true first edition. But also, in collecting these faux first editions, you will inherently learn what to look out for if and when a lucky true first edition does come across your path. Or maybe, like me, an aesthetic bookcase that gives the appearance of being filled with first editions is enough. As an example I just acquired, I recently ordered a couple copies of Matilda. I only spent just over three pounds for each of these books I'm currently holding. One of them is probably worth a little bit more than that. The other one though, by sheer luck, happens to be a first edition worth about 200. But being a bookseller as well as a collector, I have trouble hanging on to valuable first editions when they are going to look absolutely identical on my shelf, and in fact are identical in every way except for one single line of text on one page. That said, if anything less than the real deal isn't of interest to you, how do you start collecting then? Well, I've got three pieces of advice. Number one, start with modern first editions. Aside from some notable exceptions such as Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, a lot of first editions from the past few decades, even going back to the 50s and 60s, are actually quite obtainable and can be reasonably priced. This all has to do with supply and demand. In a lot of cases, there were simply more books printed in a first run, and as the books are more recent, more copies still exist in good condition. The reason that the first British edition of the first Harry Potter book is an exception, often fetching multiple thousands, it's because the first print run was actually quite small. And no, this isn't actually a first edition, but it is an early reprint featuring the original generic wizard on the back cover, which the illustrator drew before he actually read the book and did ultimately replace with Dumbledore. The holy grail of Potter first editions is the first British hardback, most of which were sent to libraries where they were subsequently destroyed as most well-read library books are. That said, after the book proved popular, they printed many more copies of the six subsequent books. So finding affordable first editions of those is much easier. All that you really have to worry about with them is if you're not in the UK, you're gonna have to pay some extra postage. Which brings me to my next point. Number two, follow the flag. Try to find books that were originally published in your country. For logistic reasons, there are simply likely to be far more copies of first editions in the countries where they originated. Supply and demand means those copies will be cheaper and easier to obtain. For instance, I was able to find this first edition first printing of The House at Pooh Corner on eBay for about £20. Now this is one of those lucky moments that I was talking about, for sure. £20 was a steal, even in the UK, where these generally go for about one to two hundred pounds, depending on condition, even more with a dust jacket. However, because the Winnie the Pooh books weren't originally published in the UK, more copies tend to come on the market here, and therefore you have more chances of finding a deal. An example of something I haven't had the chance to collect nearly as easily is the Oz series by L. Frank Baum. Other than a facsimile first edition of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, because I will never ever 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 be able to afford a first edition, the only other Oz book I currently have is an early reprint of The Tin Woodman of Oz, which I found shortly before I moved in a secondhand bookstore in the US for about $4. Now this follow the flag rule usually corresponds to the author's nationality, but not always. For instance, Roald Dahl and Agatha Christie were noteworthy for having some of their books first printed in the UK and others printed in the US. So this may take a bit of research depending on which books you're after. If you're interested in a particular author, I highly recommend looking for a bibliography which lists all of their works. Feel free to leave me a comment as well if you need help figuring out editions, or send me a message through my Instagram account, at squirrelynerdyjess, and I'll do my best to direct you to the correct information. Finally, and this 
goes beyond first editions. Think about condition. In book dealing, condition is everything. Hardcore book collectors generally go for the best condition possible, with the ultimate goal of looking like the book is brand new, straight from the publisher. So you may be able to find a deal if you're willing to accept some imperfections. The first thing to consider is completeness. Are you okay if elements of a book are missing, such as end papers, illustrations, a dust jacket if it originally came with one? This again may take a bit of research to find what a particular book should include, particularly with dust jackets. So the best resources I would recommend to start learning through are high-end rare book dealers, because they often only accept complete copies unless they are exceptionally special like signed or associate copies. One bookshop I often consult is the London-based Peter Harrington Rare Books. They have both a website and a YouTube channel with lots of information about collecting rare books. In part one, I also mentioned Rebecca Romney, who's a rare book dealer. Her company is called Type Punch Matrix, so that's another one you can check. They're based in the States. But if you are okay with something being missing, you can stumble upon some really good deals. If you happen to see my video about Fahrenheit 451, you would have seen my first paperback edition of this book. The book was published simultaneously in paperback and hardback, so this is a true first edition. Quite a few science fiction novels are like that, where the true first edition was actually a paperback, so this can be quite valuable. But my copy, as it turned out, lacked the title page, meaning it wasn't nearly as valuable to a serious collector, and therefore I got it for a steal. I also personally will happily accept books with missing end papers or something else somewhat trivial inside the book. The way I see it, my books will spend most of their time sitting on a shelf, so my focus tends to be more on the outside of the book. In thinking of the outside of a book though, dust jackets are their own special consideration. For many popular books, having a dust jacket can mean a huge leap in the price of a book. Dust jackets really came into their own as pieces to collect around the 1920s, so particularly books that had dust jackets around that time or before are incredibly rare and sought after. Some examples being The Great Gatsby, published in 1925, Peter and Wendy, published in 1911, or The Wind in the Willows, published in 1908. I've come to accept that I simply won't ever afford those dust jackets, but some other dust jackets from more modern books may be achievable. Here's one from my collection that is a true first edition, The Handmaid's Tale. This is what I mean by a modern first edition, originally published in 1985. Now following the flag, Margaret Atwood is Canadian. This is the Canadian first printing. And I think I paid about 50 or 60 pounds for this, which may seem like a lot for a book. So of course everyone's budget will be different. But this was a special treat for me as I did my very first YouTube video about this book. And as you can see, I do have the dust jacket. Nowadays, this is a very critically acclaimed and beloved book, but it didn't necessarily start that way. However, its sequel, The Testament, was very highly anticipated and had a much bigger print run. So finding a true first edition of this will be a lot easier. But beyond the completeness of a book, there are so many other aspects of a book's condition that you'll want to consider. Frankly, if you're starting collecting on a small budget, you simply may not be able to get the best of the best condition-wise. So figure out what matters to you and what you can be lenient on. And keep in mind you can always replace books later on with better conditions as your budget increases. That is, if you don't read them and then form a personal attachment to them. It also really comes in handy to learn a bit about book repairing, because you can buy books at lower prices if they're in worse condition, but then some things you can fix up yourself, such as cracked hinges or splits in the binding, loose binding that can be tightened up, even faded cloth that can sometimes be brightened up. I have some videos up about book care and repair, with more on the way if you'd like to learn more. But regardless of whether or not you have some repair knowledge, you will need to decide how poor of a condition are you willing to accept. And again, this is a totally personal preference. For me, and this may sound silly, I tend to look at secondhand books the same way I look at pets. <laughs> I prefer rescuing animals that may be older with some quirks and imperfections and giving them a loving home. You may have seen my little old chihuahuas in some of my other videos. When we adopted them, they were nine years old and one of them had a wonky hip and eye. And I'm the same with books. I like thinking that I'm rescuing books that others might not want. Not saying that you have to be that way. I am fully aware that books do not have feelings despite what Pixar has tried to teach me since childhood about inanimate objects. I will not judge you 
you for having higher standards than I do, but that's not to say I don't have any standards as far as condition. A big no-no for me is a smelly book, and I'm not talking about that old book smell because we all love that, but I mean books from smoking homes. There are ways of reducing the stench, which I did have to resort to in order to afford a particularly rare Disney book, but I try to avoid it whenever possible. I also try to avoid excessive water damage or mold, although living in the UK I come across mold and mildew much more often than when I lived in the desert. So sometimes a little bit is unavoidable and can be cleaned, but I avoid large patches of mold. Other than hygienic things, my number one focus tends to be the spine. It's the thing I'll see most when it's sitting on my shelf. I can put up with a lot of condition faults as long as the spine is present and generally complete with legible lettering. But for me, I don't typically mind a little browning or fading some wear to the spine head and foot or even some small losses. Let me give you some examples. One thing I'm working on collecting is the first printing of the first 1000 Penguin books. This series were all numbered, so I really like for the number to be present on the spine. I have one or two where the number at the base of the spine has been lost, but I have made notes to myself to try to replace them. As far as hardbacks, I've already shown you in part one my copy of Peter and Wendy, which was the original title for Peter Pan. This is a highly desirable and collectible book, meaning even reprints in this original binding can be pricey. I really had to settle for a copy that was not in the best condition, just to get one affordably. But while the boards aren't the best, the spine is okay. Hopefully one day I'll be able to upgrade this a bit, but for now it still brings me a lot of joy seeing it on my shelf. One final thing I want to mention regarding condition is ex-library copies. Books that used to be in libraries are nearly always pretty beat up and tend to have stamps and labels and markings all over them. So you should really decide up front. Ex-library books, yay or nay. If you are willing to accept ex-library copies, you will certainly find some bargains. For me personally, I don't particularly mind ex-library copies, unless there are stamps across important features. Again, I have the skills to do a lot of repair work on the books, so sometimes I'm even able to remove some of the labels and erase some of the markings to clean them up. Once you have set your condition standards, it's pretty much as straightforward as setting yourself a budget and looking at the available options within that budget. But once you've reached that point, where does one then actually look for books? That, my friends, is what I'm going to be covering in part three. So if you are interested in learning more, make sure you're subscribed and that you click the bell and done all the little silly YouTube things so that you'll get notifications when the next video is out. Special thank you to my current 4,370 subscribers. In the meantime, please be kind, be curious, and be effective. Bye! And my voice is going croaky! Ba, ba, la, la, la. Let's get, what am I gonna, what's my buy book? Let's my buy book. Let's do this. Bye. That's part two done.